You're so famous. Do you need an no. introduction? <laughs> Not really. Um, no, I'm. Uh, I can introduce myself. I'm Judy Chum, also known as Nutrition with Judy. I wanted to take a second though before you know we even started interviewing. Um, I know how much just running the Carnivore Summit, how much effort it takes to do all this. So for you all to collab and schedule with all of us, it's it's not something small. So I don't know if all the other people you've been interviewing has even recognized that, but I know, I recently know how hard it is to get all of us together and corral the troops and then get the marketing out there to the community to say, hey, there's a free resource, but it's not always eating uh, easy getting the messaging out there. So I just wanna take the second to say thank you to both of you. I mean, it takes a village and for both of you to put in this effort, it's it's a lot. And and you're doing it for 24 hours, which is insane. But you know, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, it it takes people like you to get the community, you know, educated and inspired, and it's a lot. So thank you. Judy, could I just jump onto the back of that as well? Yeah. Um, Stephen has put so much effort into organizing no, sure. this. Um, you know, I'm just along for the ride um steven's been working night and day and th this is a free event you know th there's no fee for the event uh but it has come a cost to, to steven he's, he's given up work to put into this effort we've been conversing over the last couple of weeks the amount of hours that this guy's put in um you know you deserve a gold medal steve so uh you know just uh um yeah <laughs> thank you well no, i know well, i know I, yeah. I know our team <laughs> had to shift just to make the summit happen and it was a lot more even than what we expected. And so I know it takes a lot. So thank you, Stephen. I mean, you're the graphics, the reels, getting everyone together. Like, trust me, I get it. So I think, uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure and commend you for that because it's a Maybe. lot of, I know it's free for you. And so it's not even like you're getting economically paid for it, but it's just a lot of effort. And so I think people should recognize it. it there's a lot of little things you have to manage behind the scenes. And so for everything you've done, um, you know, like I can't wait for us to get together and do our own podcast episode. But I just wanted to say thank you because it is a big deal. Thank you. That's, that's <laughs> very kind of you. And thank you, Rich, as well. Uh, but I couldn't do it without the people. Uh, you know, if I have this harebrained idea to do a 24 hour live stream and every person I approach says, no, thanks. <laughs> right, <laughs> Nothing's right. going to happen. So it is, it is a team thing. But yeah, I do appreciate it. And yes, I'm absolutely shattered and I'm really looking forward to sleeping all of, all of Monday. Um, <laughs> One of the things I did set up was for people to ask you questions because um, I think that's great. You know, they, they get a sort of um, fast track to you. Um, so I've got a question here. If we can get straight into it, Julie, sure, if that's sure. okay. Um, is I, I'll read the whole thing out if I if if I can. If there is a is there a way to heal from histamine reactions on the carnivore diet? I cannot tolerate ground beef, slow cooked meats, bone broth, mackerel all dairy except soft cheese and most eggs. I tolerate lamb, mince, beef steaks and lean fish, including sockeye salmon very well. I eat about, um, I eat just about 100% carnivore. I drink peppermint tea and sometimes use high quality olive oil on lean fish. So histamines are, the simplest way to explain histamines, it's in an immune response, right? So your body, said it's not happy with something you ate. And so now you're manifesting either itchiness, fatigue, you know, just all the symptoms that are related to immune function. And it is true that a lot of carnivores do have sensitivities to, um, I, or I guess they're suffering from histamine. So the, the root is always why, are, why is that happening? So yes, I do think that you can heal and improve and then not have to struggle with all of those sensitivities that were just mentioned. Uh, with those particular foods, but it'll, the, the goal is to get to the root. So I, in our practice, we will focus first on gut health. So maybe there's a little bit of leakiness in the gut or the gut, the wall lining is not strong enough. And so therefore proteins are getting into the bloodstream, which then have the immune system put out an alarm, which then causes histamine receptors to release histamines. And then you have that histamine response. So I would first possibly focus on gut healing and doing carnivore. Maybe you do ruminants, meats only, so beef, salt, water type of thing. And you eat the freshest, meaning that it's not really aged. You get the meat from the freezer, cook it right away, eat it. You don't eat leftovers. Like I'm assuming that's what's happening with the ground beef with you. And you try it that way. And over time with whether it's digestive enzymes, uh, probiotics, time for the gut to finally start healing without a lot of the plant toxins, that should improve your histamine reaction. 
And if it doesn't, that's when I think people should look into environmental illness. A lot of people think that histamines are just reliefs from mast cells. So it's like a mast cell um, issue, but it's not just mast cells. Histamines are on different receptors. So there is one with environmental illness, like if you're suffering from mold illness, for example, your brain is releasing histamines every time there's just any type of immune flare. And so even when it comes to foods, you'll have a reaction because maybe there's more histidine, which histidine then converts to histamines in the body. But there's always a root cause why you're so sensitive. That's why on carnivore, when as people heal, um, as an example, there's a lot of people that have seasonal allergies, but then as they eat a carnivore diet, they eat less plant toxins, they're eating less processed foods, their gut heals. And over time, they can go outside and they notice, oh, I don't need the Claritin anymore. I don't need these allergy or histamine uh, receptor uh, block receptors. And they can tolerate being outside because the bucket is less full. So I always give this example, but I really want to end this conversation with this. Think of your toxin bucket of everything that's going on in your body. So every time this overflows, you feel unwell. So on carnivore, it reduces a lot of this. And so you may feel less histamine reactions to some things, but maybe some things are still causing the bucket to overflow. So the goal is figure out what is causing this bucket. And there's so many things like I wish I could say it's one thing, but it's not. Um, the gut part is a huge part. But if that's not moving the needle enough, especially if you've been carnivore six months to a year, you can consider environment. Some people it's trauma. Uh, their body is just in a heightened stress response compared to the average person. So let's say you wake up, let's say you hear like a car backfire and somebody just in the group jumps up. That person probably has a more stress state um, or of a stress response than the average person. And you probably need healing with that because when your cortisol is high or your stress response is high, your immune system is less um, functionally operating. Fabulous. Fabulous. Oh, by the way, Judy, do you know Richard? No, I don't think yeah. I've ever met you, but I like you. Oh, talking. right. Yes. I think you two would get on. Okay. So yeah. is, is that a brand or a product? I, I don't, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So, I, yeah, th this is my brand, uh, nutritionist by trade. But, um, yeah, this is what we do in the UK. Basically, uh, we, we spread the word about low carb, ketogenic and carnivore lifestyles. Um, yeah, I, Stephen was alluding to uh, the science side of things. I like to go into the weeds in regards to the science. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to get you on on a podcast at some point. Uh, if you'd be up for that, it'd be great to uh, to get into the weeds with some of the bits. But, uh, sure. but great to have you on. Thanks for coming on board. Steve, can I ask you a question? Did I talk to you a long time ago about Carnivore 75 Hard? There was somebody in the UK I talked to a lot. I don't know if it was back if that was you back then. Would it, uh, not me. I don't think so. Because okay. I tend I do reply to virtually every message. Now I've said that on YouTube, I'm gonna get a million messages, which I won't be able to reply to. Um okay. there's a brilliant question, uh, a simple a simple prelude to it. So Roxana is asking. She wants to contact you about a specific issue. So what's okay. the best thing to do? Uh, but let me give you the question. Uh, what is the best way to test for what's happening to give you a lower leg cramp? Is there a way to test what's causing that? Yes and no. So I always say to start with minerals. Um, I think when you are eating a low carb diet, obviously you retain less water, less water retention will then cause you to know and feel more of the electrolyte imbalances. So always start with maybe you could use some Soleil water, that's just really salt water left in uh, water overnight. And then you can use like get a teaspoon or a tablespoon of that water and pour it into your water. The logic is that if you let water and salt just uh, saturate the water, the minerals will be more unbound so that when you consume that Soleil water, it will um, there will just be more accessible minerals in your system. So if that doesn't work or uh, finagling with that, then you can try the other electrolytes um, that are on the market. And if that still doesn't work, um, I always recommend a little bit of magnesium spray. So topically, when your body has magnesium through the skin, it gets absorbed way quicker through the bloodstream versus going through your gut. Um, and there's studies that show that people can supplement magnesium. It doesn't uh, absorb as well compared to if you do it topically. So I would try some magnesium spray. Perfect. Magnesium oil, magnesium spray. Make sure there's not a lot of additional addi additives, but you could spray that on your leg. Let the um, it uh, support your muscles and then see how that works. Sometimes we ask our clientele to 
use a little bit of soleil water right before bed. For some people that helps, some people that gives them too much energy. So you can try those things. And then if that all doesn't work, you can always do a hair mineral test. The way it's different than just doing blood work is blood work is always just that snapshot of time that whatever is in your bloodstream. So for minerals, it's not the most ideal because a lot of times our minerals are in our cells and that is not being measured by blood. So our hair mineral is measuring, I think, an average of three months of what's been in your cells. And we find that people that are super stressed, their magnesiums may be depleted, for example. And so you may just need to up the magnesium. But you have to also remember that sodium, magnesium, calcium, and potassium are the major macro minerals. And so it's a little of four of those that um, that you would want to make sure and balance. It is across the map. Um, I know a lot of people focus on magnesium, but there's a very small subset that actually need a little bit of calcium. And then there's a little bit larger of a subset that actually needs potassium. So you can always try a little bit, maybe 100 milligrams of potassium in the morning, see if that helps do the magnesium at night because it's more calming. And then if all of that does not work, including the hair mineral, uh, you can check your ADH, it's anti diuretic hormone, or vasopressin, all of these are blood works. And if that marker is low, that means it's a hormonal imbalance that is the kidneys are not being told to retain water, which will then help you to reduce your leg cramps. And so we are seeing that in our practice. So all the people that have just gone through everything I just talked about, we test our ADH marker through um, we, you can go to like a lab core quest and they will do the blood work and we're seeing that their hormone is so low. So what's happening is they're constantly thirsty. They're constantly drinking water, but their body's just peeing it out. And so they're not retaining then including the minerals that will then help you to have less leg cramps. Fabulous answer. Um, so the last one from the, uh, pre-submitted, and I think I should do that because people have taken the time out to go online. Sure, and sure. No, I totally I get it. Yeah, uh, Tanya, um, just to give you some context, she's still having coffee, a monk fruit sweetener. But her problem is pre-carnivore, she had chronic diarrhea. And now on carnivore for the past three months, she's still having diarrhea once a day. Suggestions, question mark. All other symptoms of uh, SIBO gone and feeling great otherwise. Okay, so if she suff suffer from SIBO and then loose stools, the two big levers I first start with is uh, manage the minerals. So you might be consuming too much salt, too much magnesium, and that can always cause the uh, peristalsis to occur too quickly. It could also be that you're not able to tolerate as much fat as you are. So your bile is just stimulating and then it's causing you to have another quick bowel movement. I would use a food and mood journal here. That would be my best recommendation. <clears throat> And I would write down like what you're eating every day, which is then causing you to have a loose stool. So is it that you have a ribeye with uh, some butter and then that's causing you within 30 minutes to an hour, have a loose stool or a bowel movement right then? It's probably that you're eating too much fat in that meal. And then I would see what meals are you not having loose stools or having less loose stools? And maybe you focus on those foods or those specific meats and whatever um, fish or eggs you may be eating. And you may be wanting, you may want to stick to that. And then I, I think it's the, the important thing is to reduce the uh, loose stools because that is depleting of your nutrients, your minerals. And so the goal is to get to less loose stools, see if maybe it's a meal timing thing, or maybe it's a certain type of cut that you have to eat for a while. And then as you heal, you can start to see, can you introduce something else, maybe for higher fat, if you realize it's the fat that's bothering you, maybe you use some digestive enzymes, um, use some lipase, uh, use some ox bile and see what is causing the the imbalance, because there's something there that's causing the loose stools, try to regulate it that you don't have loose stools anymore. And then from there, see what you can add back. And the best way to do that is no YouTube video, no podcast. It's really your own body's biofeedback. And you'll know that by doing a food and mood journal. Fabulous. Uh, Rich, did you want to add anything? Did you want to ask? No, you know, it, uh, yeah, I think Judy's just outscienced me there. I mean, there's nothing left, left to add. I think, uh, yeah, you've just taken away my favorite part of, of, uh, of doing the event. So thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I think it's because I work with the sickest part of our community, right? So I... When I wrote our, my book, it was just in a perfect world. Here's like everything based on science, based on what you can do. But then you get the harder cases and they challenge you on every single thing that you believe, 
right? And that's where I come out with all this nuanced content because we work with some of the most challenging and it's exciting, it's exhausting, but we have to keep doing research to refine the diet. And then if we fix all or support and heal all the people that are the most sick or nuanced or on the fringes, then we can help everybody that's in the main part of the carnivore diet. And that's that's why I have all these nuanced answers. And I know for some people that just listen to my channel, they're like, this is way too complicated. And you're right. I may not be the right first step for you, but there's all of this other great content that you can follow first. But when carnivore isn't working enough, that's where that's where we shine. Yeah, your book is amazing, uh, The Carnivore Cure. Um, I'm really, really uh, so impressed. And I've mentioned it to other people that have come on, actually, because you oh, okay. you do go deep and, uh, you know, talk about food dyes and colors and everything. And I think this is really underestimated because uh, when people come to carnivore and they expect that magic wand, do, yeah, I'm really fit now. And then maybe they're a little bit disappointed. There are so many other factors that are nothing to do with nutrition, I lo- you know, and it could be, well, well, we talk about nutrition, food dyes, which I don't call nutrition additives, but then you talk in epigenetics and the environment and you really go into it. And it's a, it's a really fabulous book. Um, and I think you narrate the audio book. I think it is actually you that does that. So it's pretty good. Um, there are a couple of other questions in the chat. So let's have a look. I think, um, well, actually there's comments, people commenting, uh, there was one. Is there any? Uh, oh, here we go. Here we go. I've found it now. Right, Judy. What vitamins and minerals besides magnesium might be best to absorb by our, you know, via our skin rather or orally? That's a good question. I've never actually looked into that. Um, I know that there are companies that sell patches for nutrients. So, for example, kids that can't swallow vitamins at a young age, they could stick a patch on for a certain type of illness. So let's say they have a virus, and maybe they just need some extra nutrients. I have not done the research in terms of certain vitamins beyond magnesium, that would be best absorbed through the skin. So there, what I would, my logical brain just goes to there are upper limits of risk of certain vitamins and minerals being in excess, and there's risk with that. So I would, I guess if you were to try topically, I would just make sure that some of the nutrients in those aren't don't have upper limits, because when it goes to your digestive tract, you can, there might just be less absorption, just because it goes through the digestive tract, some of it gets killed off, if you cooked it, there might be some nutrients depleted that way. Whereas if it's topical, I don't know if it just goes straight into the bloodstream as it does with magnesium. And so that would be my only concern. But I to answer that specifically, I'm not sure. But I'm going to look into that. That is, um, I never looked, I never thought about that. Steve, you moved it. You moved it again. Yeah. <laughs> don't, uh, don't keep your light under a bushel, Rich. If, if you've got something, because you're a supplement provider, you're into the science. Is there, is there anything else? No, the only thing I'd say in regards to topical solutions is that um, if you can't eat it, then it shouldn't go on your skin. Um, you know, oh, yeah. uh, this is why Agreed. I don't use uh, any shampoos or, or any um, I don't use anything on my skin other than uh, tallow. Uh, so, if, yeah, general rule of thumb, if you can't eat it, don't put it on your body. Um, I'm a big fan of, of getting all the nutrients that we can from, from food. Um, and to do that, we need to avoid the foods that are negating the body's ability to absorb those. Uh, and us living the carnival lifestyle uh, are already doing that while removing those grains, uh, and which are high in lectins and phytic acids. Um, but even within the, the keto sort of community, we're still... Uh, there the, the are keto foods in particular, um, things that are high in lectins like bell peppers and tomatoes that are preventing the absorption of other nutrients. Um, so, you know, we need to be mindful in, in regards to that. And even within within the carnival community, you know, we, uh, you, know, we, you, came back to, uh, you mentioned a sausage earlier in regards to, um, you know, being shouted at, you know, with foods that you may snack on. Um, now, I get my sausages from a local butcher. Uh, and they are rusk free because the sausages that we buy from the supermarket will contain rusk. And again, the rusk contains lectins, which is going to prevent the absorption of these nutrients. So if you are a sausage fan and you're worried about uh, nutrient absorption, uh, then ask your butcher to make you rusk free sausages and burgers, which is what I do. Um, very friendly with my butcher. So I get a lot of bang for my buck. But eat, eat your food. Try not to put so much of it on your skin. 
Can I can I say one more thing about the question? Because I I always wonder like where is the question coming from? So if it's a question of maybe this person is not absorbing their nutrients and they want an external source, um, if that's the reason, then I would just try it. So if they are taking supplements that um, in addition to their meat for whatever reason, maybe because they have good, uh, poor digestive function, maybe they're not around enough quality uh, meats. I mean, I, I don't know the reason, but um, if that's the case, then I would just try a, a patch if because um, I know that there are medical grade patches that you could put on that have some of the nutrients. And if it seems to help you, like if it supports more energy, this is where I'm so big on biofeedback. If your body seems to enjoy the, the patches or whatever topical thing that is that's mostly natural, then I would say I, I'm OK with that. I, I will say, though that I also use tallow balm, but I don't think, oh, I could eat less fat in my meat because I'm putting tallow on my face and that's enough sufficient fat for my body. I never think that way. I just think, oh, it's an additional little bits of tallow, but I still make sure to consume enough fat. Excellent, excellent. Uh, another question here, and this is from Ali D, I think. Uh, Almost every night I wake up to go we urinate uh, sometimes twice is there anything i can do during the day or before bed to reduce this occurrence carnival for five months meat dairy egg salt and water okay so hi ali um i so my first thoughts are a lot of times we wake up because of hypoglycemic effects meaning that your blood sugar has been imbalanced insulin has not been doing the best job in trying to balance your blood sugar levels and no it's five months so that can be a good amount of time but i don't know where your blood sugar was where your uh, your insulin markers have been your fasting insulin. If you're fasting, and I know in the UK, it's a little bit different. So I apologize for not knowing the conversion numbers. But if your blood glucose it is now around the 80s, and your insulin's around five, it's probably not a hypoglycemic event, you can always try CGM overnight, which is the continuous glucose monitors, the ones you put on your arms or legs, and then see what is going on with your blood sugar? If your blood sugar dips in the middle of the night, and I see it a lot with my clients where maybe it goes down to the fifties, I think that's three point something. I'm not entirely sure. So don't quote me on that. And then, uh, and then cortisol will kick in to make sure that your blood sugar doesn't drop much further. And a lot of times that cortisol kick or release will then give you energy. And then you're like wide awake. And then a lot of people will think, Oh, it's because I just need to go to the bathroom. I have a small bladder. I've heard everything and anything, but oftentimes, if that's not the reason, and if that, okay, so if that is the reason, I would say try a small snack before night. Um, I used to recommend my clients maybe have a small piece of bacon with a little bit of fat, maybe tallow, maybe a little, like a tablespoon of butter. If that doesn't carry you over, and then the mineral balancing doesn't carry you over, and you notice that at the night, it's not really like a blood sugar imbalance, I would test that ADH marker again. If it's that ADH marker, that's probably the reason you're waking up. And then it can actually be an environmental issue and not a dietary issue. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, I have got here someone saying, can it? Uh, where's the, too much fat? I'm sorry, my computer has decided to uh, <laughs> act up against me. Uh, right, here we go. This is a very interesting question. What are your go-to sites for nutrition research? Because your 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 <laughs> stuff is where I go. Uh, so yeah. that's interesting. Uh, everything and anything. Uh, so I used to. Trust, I, I'm not going to name names in our space, but or like in the wellness space in general, but I used to go to the bigger accounts, right? So like, the perfect example would be Huberman. So I don't, I, I don't really listen to his content. But let's say I used to go to people like Huberman or these big, in, bigger institutes. And then when I started working with the most difficult cases, I was starting to see like, it doesn't line up always. So I try to get information and resources from a lot of everything. Uh, I look at studies, we look at uh, our cases. And when we're like, that didn't work, though, what that study was saying, or what someone else was sharing. And so as we've, um, I guess what we really do in my practice, as well as in my books and research is, I marry the science with our clinical practice. And we've worked with over a 1000 carnivore specific clients and patients. And so we see a lot that may not exactly fit and marry with carnivore. And then we dig, um, I can give you a fascinating recent thing that we've been researching. So a lot of people suffer with candida or uh, fungal overgrowth. And we didn't understand how carnivores that are no longer eating carbohydrates are still suffering from jock itch, candida, 
um, scalp itch. I'm trying to think of the other stuff, but oh, and chronic UTIs. And it didn't make sense because they swear our clientele are swearing they're not eating any more sugar, not even from fruit. And as we're doing more research, uh, mold is one example that your candida can persist from mold overgrowth. And then there's other nutrients. So like there's vitamin B1 gets affected molybdenum. And again, that's like us going down these rabbit holes, and then finding disparate information, and then we marry it all together. And that's some of the research we're doing now. And over time, we will probably release the research we have found. Um, another very fascinating, interesting thing, a tidbit with that fact is the way that candida breaks down, um, the breakdown molecule is very similar to alcohol. So I don't know exactly how it all works yet. But our research is showing if you suffer from candida, you probably do not want to be drinking any alcohol. Yeah, and that's a that's a brilliant answer. Um, I actually, I, I've got my science degree, and I did a lot of research. But sometimes when when you're reading stuff, it doesn't it doesn't work for me. And I'm just uh, going to tell you something. About four years ago, I did, I used to be a phlebotomist and oh, okay. I, I'm a specialist practitioner in diabetes and and what was happening was the HbA1c was going up but their average blood glucose was um, you know Plateau. pretty good so it made no sense and that's I researched that and I could not find the answer to that so I had to think now one of the things you're taught when you're a phlebotomist is if someone's hemolytic that means their red blood cells die too soon because the HbA1c is a calculation not a direct measurement right uh, you are told to ignore the HbA1c because it's artificially low. So I just thought, well, hang on a minute. Well, what if the red blood cells are lasting longer? Therefore, you get this artificially high HbA1c. I'm not saying I'm a big, clever person and I'm amazing, but sometimes you have to do your own original right. thought. That's the point I'm making. And then two years later, I'm seeing my theory, which I did put out publicly on steak and butter gang and i did video about it saying i think red blood cells are lasting longer on carnivore that's why hba1c goes up and then we've got people like ben bickman saying this is the reason and i i think sometimes you can be the original person that thinks it i'm not saying uh he heard my video i'm sure he came to that he's pretty clever i'm sure he came to that that realization so sometimes research is novel uh not often um but um I won't mention names, but there, certainly when I started many, many years ago, there were people I thought, yeah, they're the go-to person. And then as you get more experience, you think, well, actually, that doesn't seem to be correct. Right. So um, you have to be constantly looking, don't you, for new sources of info? Yeah, I, I think from my amazing patients and clients, I have learned that you cannot take anything for fact. Um, we, I used to think, you know, there's so many carnivore myths, like even when I first joined, I think it's like almost six years ago, you know, you can never gain weight on carnivore, you can never there's just so many things you never need supplements on carnivore. There's all these little nuances that people believed that I didn't. It, so for me, it didn't hold true either. But I thought maybe my n equals one is broken, maybe my eating disorder background is broken. And that's why I'm gaining weight. So I could rationalize and justify for me, why the if you want to call it dogmas or these rules didn't work for me. But once I have a thousand people that we work with and we work very, it's not just like we work with them for a second. It's like very deep uh, clients where we know their full medical history. And once it doesn't work for them, or we see a lot of people that didn't have eating disorders actually gain weight or stall, I started realizing a lot of what we are hearing. It's just people are repeating the same thing over and over. And I know it's great. It helps us to be a community, but we have to challenge things that may not always be true. And that's why I always bring up stuff of, you know, I was the first one to bring up that liver is not always good to eat all the time. And then I got so much uh, flack for that. But then it's true. There's some people that shouldn't be eating a lot of organs and we see it in our practice. And I only shared these nuances because I'm sure there's someone that's watching this or something else I've shared that maybe that one nuance is true for them. And maybe that is the one hindrance on carnivore that's not allowing them to heal. Maybe for somebody, they've been perfect carnivore and they're just self-sabotaging because they're like, I'm not good enough. Um, I'm eating too many herbs or uh, or seasonings or it's because I had that one keto treat, that one thing or I left in one supplement and that's why I'm not healing. And 
what we find is it's not that small of a thing, but it's actually maybe something more root cause like the environment or mold or, or stress. Like if we don't deal with trauma, that can actually impact your ability to heal. And so I think it's, it is so ideal to challenge whatever status quo is, because that's why we're even in a carnivore diet. We questioned what standard care recommends. And we are, we're saying we're going to eat a meat or fat that you're saying is going to kill me of high cholesterol and heart disease. And now I'm finding that it doesn't do that. So then what else are we even in our little bubble? We can, we need to always challenge because what we want is for people to do carnivore. And then we have every single answer for all the nuances so that people can thrive. And that means everyone can thrive. I hate that people leave our diet and say, it didn't work for me. I would love to know what didn't work for you because let's find that and let's resolve that. So we could say this works for everyone. And I think it requires nuanced care. So when people are like, everyone just eat meat, just go stricter, stricter. It's like, no, not for everybody. For some people, it's something also there's a chronic infection or, or it's trauma, or you need more faith, or it's the, it, um, the community that you don't have. There's so many reasons why people don't heal with just nutrition. Nutrition is absolutely the foundation. And I think we need to say, I am my own N equals one. And regardless of what influencer or practitioner or doctor is saying, if it doesn't work for me, you have to trust that. And you have to be honest that you have given it a full and honest go. But if it doesn't work for you, trust that on your body because your body's biofeedback is the most powerful N equals one for you than it is for anybody else. Judy, thank you so much. Uh, great value. Um, we've got Robert Sykes, the keto savage, oh, waiting in the room. Can I, can, I, can I bring him in? Yes, bring yes. Him in. Hello, hello. Hello, Robert. <laughs> I, I apologize. I'm like traveling across the country right now, and the Starbucks that I was planning on doing this in is not starbucks anymore so i'm like at a picnic table in some spot so hopefully everybody can hear me all right hi robert hello hello okay i'll leave (laughs) 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 judy that was to be here thank you so much guys yeah judy that was absolutely fantastic thank you so much for that super in-depth uh highly knowledgeable um yeah thoroughly enjoyed thank you well, thank you for having me i i'm i appreciate all of the efforts that our community does as a large and i think it's important that we just um the more we stick together the more we can accept yeah we have nuances differences and that's okay we are still a community that really believes in meat as the fundamental baseline of nutrition and from there we can get nuance and that's normal i don't look anything like you guys right that's normal to have differences and we should embrace that rather than say, wait, so-and-so said this and -and so-and-so said that. No, it's we come together and we may have differences in our diets and that is completely okay and normal and do and find what works best for you. And that will always be the best answer. So thank you guys. I'll talk to you later. Go Robert. Fantastic. Thanks, Judy. Bye, Judy. That was great. Mr. Sykes, for people that don't know you, would you like to just give us a little introduction as to who you are and why would I bring you on this? Yeah, yeah. So I'm Robert Sykes. I've been doing a natural ketogenic bodybuilding for the past eight years now that I've been keto. I've been bodybuilding for about 14 or 15 years. Now. I just uh, love everything about the diet, love everything about the lifestyle. I got my pro card in 2017 following a ketogenic approach, and I have not looked back since. I've started a podcast, multiple other brands, and I'm just trying to – dedicated my life to educating others on what I have learned throughout the process to hopefully help people find their way to health. Wow. That, uh, that was, that was quick. That's brilliant. And this yes. guy invented the key. Our brick. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that developed as a passion project back in 2017 when I did my first prep, uh, made that out of my own necessity for something that was ketogenic and shelf stable and uh, to streamline my own meal prep endeavors. And I've just been uh, making those alongside my wife and team ever since. Fabulous. And you know Richard, don't you? Yes. We're actually on the podcast together two weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe. Yes, we did. Well, we've done two recently, haven't we? You, you came on uh, on with Alan and myself, and we both came on yours. Uh, and I had to leave a little bit early, didn't I, to pick my little girl up from school, which I was devastated about. But um, yeah, thoroughly enjoy that. Always great chatting. Always great Always chatting with you. Always a pleasure. Appreciate that. So, Richard, you you fire a question at uh, Robert. Go on. 
So, yeah, what brought you into the space, Robert? Obviously, you know, we know that you compete professionally. We've gone into detail in regards to what you do to implement that sort of thing. What decide, What made you decide to come into it? Because what we do goes literally against the grain, doesn't it? It goes against everything that we taught, especially in, in, in terms of bodybuilding. Uh, you were competing in bodybuilding. It's a heavily carb-driven uh, carb driven environment. Um, and to go against that grain, I don't know if you noticed the same, but I, I was ostracized from the community as, as the freak that didn't consume carbohydrate. Uh, what what decided you? What was that uh, that catalyst that brought you into into being ketogenic? Yeah, yeah. So I had been competing since 2012 was my first show. I'd been bodybuilding for about 14 or 15 years. And after about half of that, um, after I did my first show, I lost 80 pounds in 12 weeks, competed. Won the show, was incredibly lean, but then after that show, I went through a pretty standard, um, you know, catastrophic, I guess I would say, uh, rebound period in which I put on about 20 pounds in 24 hours, and I was just binging on everything in sight. That kind of led to an eating disorder, binging and purging. That plagued me for two or three years, and that was all while following a carbohydrate-based approach, you know, very high protein, very low fat, very high carb. And I realized that there just had to be a better, more sustainable alternative to that. So I started dabbling around with carbohydrate backloading developed by John Kiefer. And that's basically keto during the day and then high glycemic index carbs at night. And I recognized that I actually felt better before the introduction of those carbs. Uh, so I just started phasing them out entirely. And I was doing carb backloading minus the carbs. That would have been about 2015 before keto was popular. There wasn't any books or podcasts or, you know, anything really on the subject matter at that point uh, but I found that I felt better I didn't have any hindrance for my performance in the gym so I just kept doing carb backloading minus the carbs and lo and behold I realized that that was in fact keto and I hadn't looked back since uh, like I said I did my first ketogenic prep in 2017 and maintained a very high fat protocol moderate protein very low carbohydrate and I was able to develop a better physique for that competition season. I got leaner than I ever had before. My hormones stayed more stable and I just felt better. It was more sustainable. I didn't feel guilty about the foods I was eating and I was able to kind of bypass that whole disordered eating relationship. And at that point, I knew that, you know, from a performance standpoint, there was certainly some efficacy to this ketogenic animal based diet. And I haven't looked back since. Yeah, fantastic love that it um i mean it was a slightly different reason for me um i began restricting the carbohydrate for a similar story um there was very little information in regards to carnivore being ketogenic at the time i almost stumbled upon it by accident after losing the weight and reversing all of my illnesses i decided to compete in order to show people that you know you, you can build muscle and be fit and healthy while um on a low carbohydrate diet um so yeah, I, I think the, the same as you, I fell into every pitfall that you can imagine. I made every mistake that you can think of because there was no information around and the little information that was available was misinformation. Uh, and I think, you know, it's that uh, making those errors and those mistakes that, that lead to, to, to the success, isn't it? And, and our ability, you know, to, to teach and help others um, move forward because, yeah, the amount of pitfalls that I fell into um absolutely incredible I, i've tried with you know as you say carb loading carb cycling um and we're constant we're in this uh, society where we are told that carbohydrates is, is crucial for those heavy lifts is crucial to build muscle it's crucial for energy and what i qu quickly realized was that i was building muscle quicker than anybody else that i knew um you know all natural uh, no carbohydrates i was on lots of protein lots of fat uh, you know we've gone through the fat and protein uh, protocol uh, which is similar but slightly different there's, there's slight variances isn't it in regards to the amount of protein and, and fat that we we implement during bulking and cutting but one of the things that we both agreed on was that our ability to uh to cut incredibly quickly for competition reducing the amount of time that we were in that period of cutting enabling us to build muscle um for longer periods of time throughout the year uh, so lots of benefits um i mean we're told carbohydrates are essential for muscle protein synthesis Carbohydrates have zero impact on muscle protein synthesis when adequate leucine is, is consumed. Uh, but what does increase muscle protein synthesis is the co-ingestion of fats with protein. Uh, and that's a ketogenic lifestyle, um, you know. Uh, and coming back to the foods that we eat, these are foods that nature presents um, in its purest form. Eggs, you know, almost equal levels in gram for protein to carb. 
uh, sorry, protein to fat, uh, steak, chicken breast with the skin on, all of these sorts of things. Um, so it's been absolutely you know, uh, life changing for me in regards to competition, um, the ability to strip fat and compete. But what I the agree. biggest the biggest change for me, I mean, you know, that came in regards for almost aesthetic purposes, if you like, but it's the health and well-being, isn't it? It um, the way that it makes you feel all of these aches and pains go away. So have you benefited? Obviously, you know, you, you've succeeded uh, professionally in, in bodybuilding. Um, where have you succeeded in your personal life in regards to health and well-being? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the bodybuilding has been great for me. The The lessons I've learned from bodybuilding have transcended the sport and become, you know, just very pivotal in all aspects of life. But when it comes to bodybuilding as a sport, the reigning champ of nutrition is probably the flexible dieting if it fits your macros approach. And there are multiple philosophies of nutrition, but I feel like the, the, the interest in that is to give people more variety and to make things more sustainable in that net nature. And I, I do think sustainability is key. But yes, you can get incredibly lean with a very mixed diet eating you know, Twinkies and, and Hot Pockets and whatnot. But I think there's a massive disconnect between what can you get away with versus what you optimize for. And I think when people make that switch in things, that really helps improve their overall relationship with food. Um, so many competitors in the in the bodybuilding circles, and you can attest to this, like having disordered eating is not an uncommon thing. Like most competitors leave the show, that finish line's been crossed, and they go off the rails, and they have a very negative relationship with food that just eats at them at all hours of the day and night, you know, apart from the competitive season. And I feel like once you get to a point in life where you have a healthy relationship with food, which I believe is largely a result of not feeling guilty about the foods you're consuming because you feel confident they're all nourishing your body as they are if you're following an animal-based approach, then you don't have to have that guilt associated with it. And that becomes much more um, sustainable in and of itself. So that has been a huge benefit for me and so many others because there isn't that a guilt associated with it. You don't have this binging, purging tendency, and you're just able to be more in tune with what your body needs and you know responds best to, and you just remove that noise from the dietary equation. Yeah, and that, and that's a big thing, isn't it? I think um, you know, food addiction re rears its head again. Um, you know, I, I I don't think I've ever said this publicly before. Um, at least I, I don't think so. But uh, you know, before um, I began my ketogenic journey, uh, I would make myself sick. You know, I was I was so obese. Um, you know, I, I would make myself sick in order to to, to try to lose weight, and and it's it's embarrassing to say, um, but this is what you know life. Uh, pushes us to isn't it um you know food addiction is a real thing uh, and this is also rampant within the bodybuilding community i knew lots of competitors who were on lots of carbohydrates who would do this regularly leading towards a competition um and it it saddens me to think that you know yes you have a goal that you want to achieve um but the addiction of the food that you were consuming is driving you, you know, to do this. If you didn't have that addiction in the first place, you wouldn't be over consuming on these carbohydrates and causing, you know, this, uh, this, this these backward steps in regards to your preparation in in, uh, in competing. Do you, do you see an awful lot of that? Have you come across an awful lot of, um, you know, what I'd class as severe sort of food addiction in regards to purging or making yourself sick for competition? And, and do you think that, uh, potentially live in this lifestyle could be an option or an opportunity to gravitate away from that because i don't know about you but i find it difficult to to gain weight you know eating the food that we we consume um yes you can do it you can over consume but it's a lot more difficult to get fat eating meat isn't it oh for sure 100 I mean, percent. when i was doing carbohydrate based approach there would be times where i would bulk up you know bulk up uh, to 230 pounds <laughs> that unnecessary i was eating you know way too much food but it was all coming from processed sources that were not fueling my body properly even when i'm really aggressive with the caloric surplus now following a ketogenic carnivore approach like i cannot get above 190 pounds you know to save my life and it's that good thing because quality of weight like even when i put on a healthy amount of body fat in the building phase it's not like a noise uh it's not like a, it's not like a bad weight it's a good weight uh, you know, you need to be in some caloric surplus to be able to embrace putting on a little bit of body fat when the goal is to optimize muscle building. And people need to embrace that in and of itself. But it's much better, much easier to eat intuitively and maintain the 
health, uh, you know, healthy degree of body fat with this approach. And I think people just don't realize how common this binging, purging, eating disorder tendency is amongst the dieting community. But even outside of the, uh, you know, bodybuilding and fitness community, it just runs rampant everywhere. And I think a lot of that is due to the hyper palatable nature of the heavily processed carbohydrates, the sugars, the sweets. And if you're eating food that you don't have to feel guilty about eating because you know it's nourishing you and providing, you know, benefit, then you don't have that, that guilt association with it. Um, you know, like many of the competitors that I are, am up against, they're, they're dropping their dietary fat just intensively uh, to the point where they're even removing fish oil pills, which is going to have a massive down regulation towards their hormonal health. Um, so they'll see ter testosterone just totally plummet. And you can bypass so much of that by maintaining a healthy degree of dietary fat, healthy degree of protein, and then no carbohydrates necessary. Yeah, fantastic. So what would your protocol be for, for say, maintenance? So, uh, you know, we spoke to um, uh, the composition consultant earlier, Johnson. Um, we've had Coach Bronson on. Uh, all sim very similar sort of um, uh, thoughts in regards to protein to fat ratios. Slight variations, but I'd be inclined to say that, you know, it was all pretty similar. What what would you regard as the perfect um, protein to fat ratio in regards to, um, to, to grams um, I, I don't like working in, in the calorie sort of thing, but I mean, if, if you want to work in that as, as a percentage uh, or, or, or grams in regards to fat and protein, um, yeah. what, what would you recommend? So it really just depends what the primary goal is. As a general rule of thumb, like in a building phase or a maintenance phase, you know, a simple one gram of protein per gram of dietary fats uh, seems to work out pretty well for the masses. Um, obviously, you need to be consuming ample total calories for your body and your goals. When I start get into a competition prep, I'll typically start at a higher fat ratio to just optimize fat metabolism and ramp that up. And then I'll, I'll simultaneously increase dietary protein while dropping dietary fat until I find my unique protein threshold because everybody's going to have a different threshold, so to speak. And then from that point, I'll start dropping dietary protein as well. All the while total calories are dropping, um, to tr trying to figure out, you know, at what point my body responds best to the caloric deficit. Uh, but again, a general rule of thumb for most people is around that one gram of protein to one gram of dietary fat. And that's what you see in nature with most foods, like a whole egg, for instance, you see in a lot of animal-based cuts. Um, and if you're consuming calories, that one-to-one -one ratio of protein to fat works out really, really well for most people. Yeah, fantastic. And I think that's a recurring um, sort of theme today, isn't it? The sort of that ratio of one-to-one -one seems pretty close. Uh, I know there's variations depending on goal. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty much what what um, what I do on a daily basis is eating food as nature intended. Um, I will uh, change uh, the percentage depending on goal coming towards competition, and I'll do a similar thing to you. I'll test the metabolism by increasing fat initially, uh, and then reducing dietary fat. That, you know, uh, I'll keep protein to a maintenance, so I won't go below 0.5 grams per pound. Um, you know, this is where I believe maintenance to be at the lower at the lower end. Uh, but I, I'll uh, I'll manipulate fat along along the way. Um, but again, I mean, it's competing isn't healthy, is it? You know, taking your body to a two percent body fat is not healthy, and and uh, I'm sure you'll agree. You know, we don't recommend this to 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 the average listener unless you're, you're looking to achieve a goal. But that's exactly what we are doing. It's, it's goal specific, isn't it? You know, we we get on stage and we win these competitions because we take the body to the extremities that that uh, that others are not willing to go to. Um, have you got anything to chuck in there, Steve? Uh, yeah, I just want to cover the uh, submitted question and uh, the can, question sorry, on I the screen. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. someone for context. Uh, how tall are you, Robert? I am five. Well, my wife says I'm five seven. I say I'm five eight. So we'll call it five. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And we had a submitted question. This comes from Matthew. Uh, what are your thoughts on doing a high intensity resistance training workout routine such as Mike Mensah or Dorian Yates on a carnivore diet versus high volume training? So the beautiful thing about training is that there are multiple ways to skin a cat as the saying goes. I've played around with body part splits focusing on increased intensity. I've played around with right now I'm doing a full body split in which I'm training every single muscle group every single time I train. So less intensity for a given muscle group but more frequency over time and, and winds up being more volume. And I've seen growth and success with all forms. The main thing that you need to do when it comes to building muscle is check four boxes. 
ample protein, ample caloric intake, ample stimulus, and ample rest. If you're doing those four things, you will grow and develop muscle tissue. Uh, so no worries there. As opposed as as far as the higher intensity versus higher volume goes, I just try to mix it up. Like figure out what their body responds best to. Figure out what their body sustainable. Because with either of those options, if you're consistently doing it and implementing progressive overload principles, you will continue to see progress. Yeah, I think putting the work in, I mean, it's as basic as, as that, isn't it? There's so many people looking for the perfect program. And, and and often you just want to say to them, just do some basic exercises and actually put a shift in. And then yeah. you'll get a response. They seem to think that there's a magic program that's going to make the difference. And it's not. It's actually what you do. So you yeah. could be doing some basic compound movements and get some results. Or you could buy a fancy pants program. Not put the yeah. effort in. You're not going to get the results. I think there's a lot of overthinking that takes place, both within the fitness realm and nutrition. You know, like, as, as we can all attest, when it comes to nutrition, you know, you can do a classic 80-20 analysis of it. 80% of one's progress and results are going to come from, you know, a 20% uh, you know, input. And then you can kind of really finesse things for the next the last 20% of, of benefit. Same is true with nutrition. I mean, my first year of training was done in my dad's garage with tractor weight that I had laying around that I saw tremendous success with just those rudimentary basics. Uh, so, yeah, I think... The, the lack of uh, consistency is where people hang up, and I feel like that's oftentimes triggered because they're trying to major in the minors and reach some perfection that's just unattainable. So just simply getting in there and putting in the work, that's going to yield the results. Rich? Yeah, it, yeah I agree. Um, I think that's you know, the, the, the fundamental um, I've I've always been a, a, an out-of-the-box of, of the box thinker, uh, if you will, and I've always... I've always looked for that extra one percent um, because if if I'm if I'm not looking for it, someone else is. So I agree completely with what you guys have said. But I also think that you know those um, those, those those finer points make a difference. Um, you know, in regards to the way that I I used to train, um, I used to look for mTOR activation via uh, mTOR reset. So I would try to activate mTOR uh, four times throughout the day. Um, uh, I, I know that you know this is small percentage gains, but in uh, an industry where you know it, it is um uh, down to opinion on stage you know you could have the best physique on stage but someone else's opinion is what matters unfortunately isn't it um you know i'd have to take condition to stage that was unparalleled um so i would be uh, conscious in building lean mass so what, what i would typically do and i'd love to hear your thoughts on this so i would eat my last meal let's say uh, 8 p.m so that's one end to activation uh, I, I train in the morning at 8 a.m. So I'd gone 12 hours before training. Training would activate mTOR. Uh, I'd go four hours without eating, so I'd activate mTOR again. Four hours after that, and four hours being 8 o'clock again without snacking in between. So I'm activating this mTOR reset, uh, not via uh, IGF-1, but activating mTOR directly. Uh, this would allow me four mTOR activations while fasting for 16 hours, allowing me to increase testosterone and human growth hormone. I believe that was pivotal to my, my progression and building the lean mass and what I deem to be the top end of what's physiological possible with, without supplementing. Um, and, and I'd implement that and, and I would uh, be mindful of consuming, um, uh, you know, high quality protein. So I would consume most of my protein from red meat because of the higher leucine content, um, the, the higher fat content. I'd avoid, you know, red meat as much. If I was consuming protein, I made sure I consumed it with fat. Um, uh, I looked into rep ranges, you know, it, uh, the amount of time that you train. So I, 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 in the big early stages, I, I would train for hours and hours in the gym, um, which I soon learned was counterintuitive because the elevation of cortisol is catabolic. Um, so then I, I switched my training from these big heavy lifts for hours into, um, uh, you know, eccentric movements, which is something that, um, you know, composition consultant mentioned earlier, uh, you know, something that he practices due to injury and things. Um, so, I moved away from the heavy weights, concentrated on eccentric movements, um, looked at my uh, my rep ranges, and I wouldn't train longer than 45 minutes to an hour. And all of these things coupled together. Uh, I also consumed, I made sure I consumed um, uh, three tins of sardines or mackerel per day uh, in order to get my omega-3s to help with um, recovery and inflammation. Um, and amongst other things, creatine, pivotal as well. I made sure that I was consuming creatine. I experimented with the amount of creatine. 
Uh, I found that taking creatine twice a day, split in before and after training, all of these little things added up to that 1%. Uh, and I believe that it was that 1% that made the difference. So I completely agree with putting the hard work and that is the fundamental, but I was working my butt off to, to, to overcome all of these things in a world that is heavily carbohydrate driven. Um, you know, and I was the outcast. I was the freak in the corner that didn't consume carbohydrates. Uh, and year on year, I went back a little bit better, a little bit leaner, a little bit bigger. Um, and that's what allowed me to achieve those goals, you know. Um, so, yeah, that, that's my experience. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on, on that. Yeah. No, that's I, a bit too much. <laughs> Throw that all out there. <laughs> as a sport, that's typically brought, it's the extremists that are in the sport, the people that are fighting for that 1%. Absolutely agree. I think, you know, figuring out what those little nuance changes and tweaks. I mean, if, if, if I told that it, eating dirt would make me gain 1% more lengthy. <laughs> exactly. Really optimizing the sleep, optimizing the absorption of the nutrition you're consuming is very important. Like a lot of people forget that. You could have the macros dialed in perfectly, consume all the right foods, but if you are consuming those foods in a stressed state with elevated cortisol, not ample recovery time, and the the absorption of that's going to be hindered, and then you're just shooting yourself in the foot there. So really optimizing all things across the spectrum as best you can is absolutely key. And I think, you know, there's actually something to say about, you know, overtraining, training for too long. Um, you know, I love the intensity workouts, but at some point there's, you know, training for four or five hours a day is going to be counterproductive. Uh, so the recovery portion is very, very important, and I've I'm the, with the worst of them about sacrificing sleep quality to try and get more done and, and getting ample sleep is absolutely paramount with building more lean tissue. So getting that dialed in is very important. Um, and then I think you, you also mentioned, you know, consuming dietary fats in tandem with protein. That is very, very key. I see so many people just simply consuming like protein isolates uh, without any fat uh, in tandem with it at all, which is going to hinder the absorption of that protein too. So making sure all those boxes are checked so that the efforts that you are putting forth are actually, you know, being useful uh, is, is very much so the key. Yeah, for sure. And a big important point that, oh, so, sorry, Stephen, go on. Well, I was, I was going to say, we, we've got a question from uh, Jennifer, who's going to be our guest in three hours time. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but Robert, can you build muscle if you're also fasting? Just, I just wanted to squeeze that in before you uh, you run out of time. Yeah, Longer so fast than intermittent fasting. The the fasting community is very much so a proponent for fasting being beneficial for increasing growth hormone, things of that nature. And there there are some definite benefits in that regard. However, I think most people that are going the route of extended fasting are having a more difficult time consuming a caloric surplus. And when you put everything together that is going to be more of a you know key factor than just simply the minute increase in growth hormone from an acute extended fast so if the goal is to build muscle then i would encourage people not to try and do both simultaneously a lot of people in the fast community are doing so to lose weight i don't ever really recommend extended fasting as the primary objective you know of weight loss um so i try to make sure that when the goal is to build muscle i'm checking those boxes you know being in a surplus consuming ample protein um and then Generally speaking, extended fasts are not going to be the best combination if the primary goal is to build muscle. You can certainly do it from time to time. And when I am in a significant surplus, I will do some strategic extended fast to get my digestive system a break. Um, but I don't recommend doing that on a regular basis if the primary objective is to build muscle. Thank you. Yeah. Go on, Rich. Yeah, love that. It uh, Again, uh, you know, uh, that's why I split the fast in between those four M2 activations. So I was still getting a little bit of uh, of potential gain. Uh, you know, and, and unfortunately, there's no way that we can measure this. Um, we can look at the research and science, but I can't say 100% that because I was fasting for 16 hours a day that the increase in testosterone or human growth had any impact on muscle building. But it certainly didn't hinder. Uh, but I agree with extended fasting. If, if you are looking to build muscle, extended fasting um, is anti-catabolic. Uh, but it's counterintuitive to build in. Um, but those those daily fasts uh, didn't hinder my ability to heal repair. But coming back to a point that you made, sleep and recovery. Recovery is something that people don't get enough of. And sleep was always my biggest downfall and still is. I do not get enough sleep. Unfortunately, I'm in a similar position to yourself, self-employed. Um, I'm up 
all hours stressing about business and money and bills. Uh, so sleep is a massive factor in my life that I have uh, uh, yet to address. I've practiced, um, you know, meditation and all sorts of things. But, um, you know, uh, if we have an expert or any of you have any advice on improving sleep quality, this is the only area in my life that I feel that is lacking for me now is, is the sleep side, unfortunately. And it is so, so important and it does not get anywhere near enough airtime. So fantastic, uh, fantastic point made there. Uh, and that was something popped up with James Curtis, I think, uh, Steve, was it? Yeah, I think but we've got Lily Kane now in the waiting room. Um, and we can't keep our guests waiting. So uh, <laughs> sure we Robert's done, done yeah. in 30 minutes and it's been fantastic. Robert, I want to thank you so much. And do you know what? I'm going to thank you for something else that you did for me. I'm not going to say it out loud, but you know what I'm saying. That was that was a really lovely thing to do, all right? So uh, it made my day that week, made my month. So you're, you're a fabulous guy. I promise you, people, so he's very genuine. In fact, every single guest is incredibly genuine, and uh, I, I can assure you, it's just uh, – I'm going to start breaking down into tears now because it's been so hard to put this together, and everyone's been fantastic. So uh, I'm going to bring Lily into the room, if that's okay. And, uh, Robert, do you know Lily Kane? Yes, I actually had Lily on my podcast uh, last week. I haven't gone live yet, but we were, we were chatting last week. 